SCP-001, The Ones That Got Away The SCP Foundation is often considered to be one of the most capable organizations within the weird fiction subgenre, as they tend to have to be to do what they do. Between their wealth, resources, experience, and even anomalous capabilities, the Foundation often has a firm grasp on protecting Earth and humanity. Despite all of this though, and despite all of their power, the Foundation still routinely has anomalies breaking out of containment. Surely an organization as great and as experienced as this wouldn't have much trouble containing a simple statue made of concrete and rebar, and yet containment breaches continue to occur. This SCP-001 proposal takes a look as to why this might occur, and as to why, perhaps, those breaches are outside of the Foundation's control. I will take note before we start that this is a somewhat humorous and silly proposal, so consider this a heads up if humor is off-putting to you. We begin with a video transcript showing a man named Leg running through the halls of Site-01, carrying a leather briefcase, and it's noted that he's already late. He approaches a guarded door, where he's frisked by two armed men with an annoyed look on his face. He then proceeds into another hallway and approaches some elevator doors, checking his watch and cursing. After passing a biometric scan, the elevator doors open, and he begins to descend down the site, tapping his foot rapidly. Upon arriving at his destination, he quickly exits and proceeds towards the council room of the overseers. He then stands outside of the meeting room's door, opening his briefcase and taking out a large stack of stapled papers and a USB hard drive. He stares at his writing before the door's buzzer chimes and he enters. With that, we're given Site Director Paul Legg's proposal for SCP-001 which denotes a pervasive, anomalous phenomenon that is affecting the entirety of the SCP Foundation. It manifests as the failure to contain and or maintain the containment of anomalous objects, entities, and phenomena. This effect is most commonly observed during the investigatory period of anomalies, most of which conclude with the anomaly in some form of containment. SCP-001 causes the leap from the researching and testing phase of an investigation to the containment phase to be entirely infeasible in a small number of cases. This is typically caused by the manifestation of isolation, irregular and seemingly aimless events that appear to exist solely to prevent the Foundation from achieving containment. The existence of this phenomenon is based on the idea that the Foundation has access to theoretically infinite manpower, expertise in all subjects anomalous and mundane, powerful reality warping capabilities, the ability to translocate through the space-time continuum, and access to all anomalous and mundane resources, and yet containment failures still occur at a notably high rate. In other words, based on everything the Foundation has available to them, containment failure should be pretty close to zero, but instead they have a containment failure rate of around 5.2%, frequently due to circumstances outside of the Foundation's control. When that collection of incidents is eliminated, containment failures occur at a rate of 4.3%, leaving only SCP-001 as the appropriate explanation for the discrepancy. Legg has gathered five incidents that he hypothesizes SCP-001 to be the reason for their containment failures. The first anomaly is an annual 10-day festival held in Florence, Italy, that contains a mind-altering phenomenon causing everyone within a 10km range to attend the event despite the lack of advertisement for it. During the event, Two anomalous entities host a stage show, in which subjects they deem sinners are given makeshift punishments akin to what is depicted in Dante's Inferno. Both of the entities resemble animated statues in the style of the Renaissance artist Michelangelo. 
At the conclusion of the festival, all evidence of it vanishes, and all of the attendees forget everything that occurred, with the only lasting effect being a notable rise in the attendees' general piousness. Despite the original investigation into this anomaly having taken place in 1985, successful containment has yet to be established. There have been a few incidents related to trying to contain this anomaly that Legg has attributed to SCP-001. First, the head researcher on the anomaly, Joseph Pasqua, who was a former Site-322 director, deserted from the Foundation due to manipulation by one of the entities. Pasqua was in hiding for over 30 years before being located in Vatican City as part of the Papal Conclave, the group of Catholic cardinals that assembled to elect a new pope. Then, during the 1986 investigation, a previously unknown entity that identified itself as God's Strongest Soldier manifested on the festival grounds, resembling an animated mascot costume of a dove, two meters in height and hollow. Responding agents of an MTF were the first Foundation personnel to interact with it, during which it spoke in rhyme and repeated the phrase Tweedly D and Tweedly Da. When one of the MTF members told the entity that they were here for the festival and tried to push past it, the entity pulled out an oversized wooden mallet and struck the agent, launching them into the stratosphere. It then proceeded to attack the remaining members of the MTF in a similar manner. Later, during the 1988 investigation, agents attempted a pacifistic route of cordoning off the entrance to the festival gathering place and instituted quarantine orders to city residents. This culminated in a mass of over 100,000 Florentines attacking Foundation personnel, with agents being slaughtered, cannibalized, and their remains tossed into the nearby river. During the 1989 investigation, an invisible barrier manifested at all entry points whenever a member of Foundation personnel attempted to enter. Personnel who managed to enter via a helicopter immediately burst into flames upon touchdown. The helicopter also crashed only three kilometers from Site-322, and the Dove entity was seen trampling on the wreckage before flapping its arms and flying away via unknown means. Over at Site-322, Tilda Moose comes up to newly appointed director Legg and asks him how he's feeling. Legg says that he's feeling good, even though he doesn't normally go into things with the utmost confidence. Moose tells him that once he gets into the director groove he'll be fine, before handing him the file on the festival, saying that this will be more than likely his capital project. Legg reads it over before asking if it's uncontainable. Moose says that it's more that it's really good at not being contained, and whatever he can think of, they've tried it. They've tried aerial bombardments, reality anchors, the Ennui protocol, even throwing SCP-682 at it, and nothing has stuck. Leg asks what is there left to do then, and Moose just says that figuring that out is his job now, and wishes him good luck. In the present day, in the O5 Council Chamber, O5-13 asks Leg how that was a containment failure rather than him just misjudging the intelligence of the statues and Birdman. Leg is startled for a moment, but then says that that's a fair point, although this was a total tonal shift from what's expected of the festival. It's taken rather seriously by the attendees and its hosts, but the hysterical nature of it makes it tonally dissonant to a point of absurdity. If there was an unknown cult of some sort attacking their researchers, or them being picked up and killed, he wouldn't have identified it as part of this proposal, but the sheer audacity puts it on the level of 001 influence. 0513 then asks him if he was startled when he spoke, leading to 056 to explain that Leg thought 13 was a normal Xerox machine until he spoke. 13 says that his mortal form was decaying, so he opted to become an immortal digital being, his consciousness being placed into a Xerox machine for the purpose of this evaluation, so he could scan and read Legg's proposal. 
Moving on. 056 asks if Lag was made director of Site 322 after Pasqua, but one chimes in to say that 322 was run by Moose for a while until a good replacement could be found. Leg then asks what happened to Pasqua, to which one says that he died by slipping down a flight of stairs and then shooting himself twice. The second example that Leg has prepared is a ritual practice that takes place every 35 years in a cordoned sub-basement of the Great Pyramid of Giza. The ritual consists of a snail race taking place between six snails, each corresponding to a different aspect of Earth or the universe. Space, memory, time, elements, geography, and morality. Upon the culmination of the ritual, baseline reality would be permanently altered based on the winning snail. Before each ritual would take place, a random male from Earth's population would be designated as the observer and forced to go to Egypt by a manipulative, incorporeal force. Following the completion of the event, all memory of it would be wiped. This anomaly was Legg's first investigation after being promoted to Site 322 director, and so it was more or less a test to see how suitable of a director he was. The observer of the race in this instance was New Jersey resident Andrew Drysdale, and after the conclusion of the event, he was captured and interrogated. Unfortunately, he was only extremely confused by their questions, asking them if they were the deep state. Leg continued to try and ask which snail won the race, but Drysdale was convinced that they were either part of the US government, a foreign government, or the Illuminati. An agent was brought in, wielding SCP-5175, a knife capable of instantly removing things from baseline reality, and which summons a Japanese spirit upon being unsheathed. The spirit proceeds to terrify Drysdale until he reveals that the red snail won, which corresponds to memory. Upon doing so, the lights in the room suddenly flicker, at which point everyone in the room forgets what they were doing there and what's going on. Afterwards, it was determined that the memory snail winning caused the Foundation to entirely forget about discovering the anomaly and the draft file for it along with all info and interviews was deleted soon after. It was later discovered that these same series of events had taken place at least four previous times, with three other site directors. The Foundation has been in a constant loop for at least a hundred years of discovering the ritual, only for the memory snail to win and erase all their knowledge of it. Through the use of an exclusionary site, the Foundation was able to recover footage of the ritual, showing all of the snails except for the memory one refusing to participate, allowing it to win uncontested. In trying to figure this out, Leg speaks with a researcher and asks how all of their files are getting wiped in the process. The researcher says that a series of extremely small and convoluted events lost all their files and their backups, and one of the server rooms got flooded after a false alarm with the fire detector. Leg is quite upset that on top of having to deal with the festival, he now has to remember about this snail race every 35 years. He tells the researcher to mark any vectors of containment they haven't penetrated yet, and maybe they'll try to pretend they're not containing it when they actually are. The researcher, however, says that a former director, Pasqua, already tried that, and it's likely that that made everything worse. The third example is Gorilla Marketing LLC, a business operated by various species of great apes. Advertisements promoting this business appeared on various web pages beginning on an unknown date in May 2015. Each advertisement contains a phone number and an image of an ape or primate. When the phone number is contacted, the caller will be greeted by a robotic female voice, who will request payment for an unspecified item. After payment details are given, 
The phone call immediately ends, and an anomalous item will instantaneously appear in the vicinity of the caller. These items have a variety of violent effects on the user, commonly turning the user into a disproportionate human-ape amalgam before killing them. Upon publishing the initial file on this anomaly for peer review, researchers Randall House and Paul Legg were met with an extreme emotional backlash from everyone who read it. This began a sweep of anomalously influenced mass hysteria across the ranks of the Foundation, leading to House and Legg going into hiding. The mob lasted for three days and managed to cause $3.2 million in damages. House and Legg's offices were raided, the mob later flooding and then burning the spaces. Parts of Site 666 and Site 322 were razed. One person managed to find their hiding location, proceeding to stand outside of the room while monotonously repeating the phrase, humans are apes, before collapsing from exhaustion and being removed. The mob also managed to tame a troop of chimpanzees, which was used to damage more property. The O5 Council ordered House and Legg's death by drawing and quartering, and two factions formed among the mob, one that wanted to use the chimps to sniff them out, and the other believed that this would be aligning with the enemy. This led to a minor civil war among the mob that left over 1,300 dead or wounded. 051 was the only member of the council to not have been affected by the hysteria, and ordered the file to be deleted. This all occurred prior to any containment efforts on the anomaly, and upon deletion of the file, all persons returned to a normal state. Amnestic stores were dispersed to all affected personnel except for Leg, House, and 051, in order to ensure that the file would never be published again. The file was placed on a quarantined server that only the three of them had access to, and numerous mimetic and cognitohazard tests were performed on it, finding no clear explanation as to why it had such an adverse effect. The server hosting the original file randomly ceased operation eight hours after it was uploaded, and when a repair of its hardware was attempted, the internal mechanisms of the server had been replaced by 14 monkeys wearing appropriate sized Foundation uniforms. A copy of the file was stored on a personal thumb drive belonging to House, but it ceased operating not long after the server did. When the plastic casing of the drive was opened, the remains of three silverback gorillas erupted from the drive. We're given a brief transcript of a call between Leg, House, and 051 in the midst of the debacle. House and Leg are quite upset about the situation, and 051 says that they triggered some sort of memeplex that everyone except the three of them had hidden in their brains. Leg stops him though, and says that this was just a simple anomaly, with no mimetic or cognitohazardous effects attached to it. It was just a business run by apes out of the Amazon, and that's all. He says that there's something else going on here, as there seems to be a pattern developing. 051 asks if they didn't just miss something, and Leg says that maybe they did, but there's nothing logical going on here, and there was no indication that guerrilla marketing would lead to this. 051 says that he's dealing with it on his end, and as he begins to say, no more monkey business, House slams the phone down. Back in the council chamber, 0513 expresses confusion over how houses can exhibit emotion, mistaking Randall House for Randall's house. 052 says that they deliberately withheld this information from the rest of them, and 051 says that they did remarking that 052 ordered some engineers to construct a brazen bull in the shape of a gorilla for the two of them. He also almost killed 059 because he wanted to use an orangutan instead of a baboon, although 2 says that he understands that choice. 055 then speaks up, in a remarkably friendly and saccharine tone, and says that 
to them, this seems like there could be a lot of factors against SCP-001 being at fault. Leg replies that there's a reason he left this file as the pending containment class, and frankly his goal here is just to make sure that this is something worth containing. It's possible he's misjudged this, but at the same time, he doesn't see a lot of these as natural anomalies. 055 says that that's a fun oxymoron, while 052 suddenly asks Leg why he was late, although Leg says that that's not pertinent at the moment, and he'd rather not get into it unless he really has to. The fourth example is a collection of Atlantic rock crabs found in Ocean City, New Jersey. When a human subject comes within range of an instance of these crabs, the crab will begin scrawling a message into the sand. In exchange for a specific amount of money or item of equivalent monetary value, the crab will sell the subject a random item they misplaced throughout their lives. During the investigation period, it was discovered that the crabs and an as yet unknown group of lobsters were in a turf war over their customer bases. This apparent rivalry had been a constant for at least 60 years prior to the discovery of either anomaly, and would turn violent consistently. Responding agents noted this as containment procedures were being instituted. At the time that the documentation for this anomaly was being finalized, a majority of the instances had been successfully contained. The first instance of SCP-001's influence here was that the remaining 75 to 100 crabs out of containment were now accepting various types of weaponry, commonly firearms, as payment for lost items. Later, Site-322 was bombarded by 10,000 crustaceans wielding appropriately sized firearms. At least 10 instances held banners depicting silhouettes of a crab and lobster grasping claws. A majority of the entities were non-violent unless provoked. Site-322 was wholly unprepared for a surprise attack of this magnitude, and all of the instances appeared to have a singular goal in mind, freeing the contained crabs. They succeeded at doing so, as it was determined that the casualties that would have occurred as a result of mounting a defense would have been too extreme. The present whereabouts of this collection of crustaceans has yet to be discovered nor have there been any reports from the public regarding them, so it's assumed that the group has relocated. Legg speaks to two of his researchers afterwards, confused about what happened. One says that they believe that the Foundation angered them, while another says that none of them could have seen this coming. Legg replies by asking him if he's looked at their track record of containment failures, and tosses over a folder containing some files. The researchers are a little confused on the point he's trying to make, so Lag begins ranting about the other anomalies and how they're screwing him and everyone else here over. One of the researchers asks if he believes that they're being messed with by some external force, but Lag says that he believes nothing, he just needs a reason as to why all of this has happened. One researcher says that they don't have an explanation for the crabs, and suggests that perhaps they're a hive mind. Legs slams his fist on the table and says that they're just crabs, which he eats with butter and garlic. His grandmother cooks them in gravy and they eat them with spaghetti, and Spongebob works for one. He asks how they knew to come here, how they organized into a militia in a week, how they learned to manufacture working firearms while in the ocean. He then goes on to ask how it makes sense that a man in a bird costume is knocking Foundation helicopters out of the air, or that a bunch of snails with incomprehensible abilities are doing one of the most menial, useless things imaginable, or that he'd be strung up like a disgraced dictator over apes. The researcher just says that they don't have an answer for any of those things at the moment, so Leg tells them to figure it out. Back in the O5 council chamber, O57 just says that this has all just been an underestimation, 
although 051 isn't so sure. Seven says that it looks to him like the anomalies weren't fully understood, and the Foundation suffered the consequences for that. Leg says that the problem arises when the unexpected occurs, and that's not to say they don't know how to handle the unexpected, but it's more when it's blatantly, randomly unexpected, with the outcome being the failure to contain and occasionally document. The crabs were very mundane, with the same behavioral pattern they'd expect from crabs, just with a slight anomalous quirk that's mild, especially taking the full scope of their jobs into consideration. 057, however, says that if he replaces the word unexpected with the word underestimated, it means the same thing. Anomalies are anomalous, and do anomalous things. Leg says that containment breaches operate within the window of the full extent of the anomaly's understood capabilities, but 052 cuts him off to say that he clearly didn't understand those full capabilities, and wonders if this proposal is about an anomaly or just his inability to get over the past. That brings us to his last example, an incorporeal force that possessed Site-322 researcher John Asniok on December 11th, 2016. This force claimed to be the mythological Kraken in search of a worthy vessel. It was capable of speech through the form it possessed. Immediately after possession, a number of growths appeared on Asniak's form, resembling black and purple tentacles. Within 20 hours, he was enveloped in these growths, although he appeared to have the entity under control for a time. This was a fruitless endeavor, however, as seven days later, he was slowly overtaken by the Force. For a sentient, sapient, humanoid anomaly, a number of protocols needed to be fulfilled before full containment could be enacted. At the time, Leg was also floating the idea of what eventually became known as the Integration Program, a way of integrating useful sapient or sentient anomalies into the Foundation. As such, this anomaly was deemed a candidate for a beta test of the program. We're given an interview between a researcher and Asniak, although the Kraken repeatedly takes over to interject, and there's a large amount of swearing here that I won't be able to repeat. The researcher asks him how he's doing, and Asniak says that it's awful, as he can't see and he keeps tripping over himself. The Kraken also keeps asking him to drown himself, and the Kraken interjects to say that it is a sea beast with many legs, and it is horrible, frightening, and blasphemous. Asniak, however, says that he's a pasty 130 pound white dude, although the Kraken says that denying his destiny will only fulfill it quicker. Asniak says that this is traumatizing but the Kraken tells him that he is whining like a small, baby, puny girl. They are a thing of myth, and they will look good and right horrific, he promises. They need to go to the ocean, however, and Asniak doesn't want to. The Kraken asks who wouldn't want to be a squid, and asks the researcher if he would like to be a squid, but the researcher replies that he wouldn't want to be a squid. The Kraken proceeds to ask if he's never wanted to wrap his many wiggly arms around the ragged underbelly of a delectable ship, tearing it apart plank by plank as the melody of millions of screaming seamen bounce across the waves, or swim so very far down into the briny depths of the great blue sea, going where no man, woman, or yummy child ever has. The feeling of billions of tons of pressure on your back as you see the creatures of the depths is indescribable. The researcher says that he doesn't want to be a squid and neither does Asniok, to which the Kraken calls him a pussycat. So far, so foundation, but when the anomaly was held in a standard humanoid containment chamber, it managed to escape through a gap between the door and the floor. It was quickly recaptured and sedated, and an examination found that the human form of Asniak had been converted into the mantle and fins seen on squids. 
Later, a tropical storm localized solely on Site-322 formed, raining a number of objects ranging from seawater to living sea life, such as sharks, penguins, and squids. The Kraken claimed that this was patronage. As time progressed, it gained a number of anomalous capabilities, including highly effective manipulation tactics, the ability to summon raging storms, control of sea life, and limited omnipotence. It proceeded to use a combination of these abilities to escape containment. While conversing with a researcher, it says that it is the god of the sea, and it should be released. The researcher refuses, but the Kraken continues, saying he wants to let it out, although the researcher still doesn't comply. When it says that it is the god of the sea, and includes the word Hark, however, the researcher says that it is the god of the sea. It then says that he wants to let it out so bad, Hark, and the researcher proceeds to let it out. It then continued to use the same phrasing on all Foundation personnel who attempted to prevent its escape, although it was quickly tracked afterwards due to its shedding a number of tentacles as it made its escape. Its corpse was soon found in the site's docking area, with the cause of death determined to be asphyxiation due to drowning. Post-mortem dissections found that while a majority of Asniok's external anatomy was converted, his internal organs were still in the process of transforming from human into squid. In the aftermath, Leg gathers everyone at the site into the lecture hall for a meeting. He begins by saying that he tries his best to keep his composure, and he likes to think of everyone here as a family, treated with respect. With that in mind, they have a major problem, and he's sure they all know what he's referring to. He's even spoken to the overseers, and they're even more unhappy with the state of things around here, and they're launching an investigation. They may have some questions for someone who gets mind-tricked by a bundle of tentacles. The crowd begins talking amongst themselves, but Lag yells that he's been good to all of them, and this is how he gets paid back. One researcher asks if he thinks that they did this all deliberately, but Lag doesn't think so. He brings up the snails, the monkey ad, the crabs and lobsters, and the festival that they've made no progress on in 50 years. The researcher says that there's no explanation here that can blame people, and there's something they're missing. Legg says that he's still getting the brunt of it all from everyone, and he just got this job. He likes it, but all this stuff keeps popping up, like the universe has something against him. He's a scientist, so he should be able to fix this. A voice from the crowd, coming from SCP-5595, a sapient gumball machine that works in the site's accounting department, tells him to do it. There's a problem here, and he should go through all the anomalies he's had an issue with and find something connecting them. Humans apparently evolved a pattern-seeking brain, and although he barely uses his, he may as well try now to get some closure. Leg agrees, as he says that he has nothing else to lose, so he may as well give it the old college try. Back in the Overseer Council Chamber, 052 says that he's officially lost her. She doesn't think that this is about containment failure, but rather this is a pattern of personal failure due to something totally mundane underestimation. Leg was new, and it's a hard job, but here he is as a director writing about his mistakes. She asks him if he's ever heard the term growing pains, and says that while this is a well-formatted and researched file, she doesn't think this anomaly exists. A majority of these occurred in late 2015 into early 2016, just as he became director. She could genuinely explain almost all of these as accidental negligence from a series of anomalies they didn't fully understand. Looking at the snails, Leg admitted that they're intelligent, 
but they're clearly even more intelligent than he or anyone had assumed, and they're definitely using their abilities to make sure they stay undiscovered and undocumented for as long as they can. She's not seen an anomaly, she's seen growing pains. As for the ape marketing company, something else is seriously going on with these anomalies that he and whoever was researching it with him didn't expect, and he sadly had to pay the consequences for it. She asks if he didn't learn something from every one of these, and he admits that maybe not consciously, but yes, he did. She then asks if he has had an incident similar to the five he's presented since 2016, and he admits that he hasn't. She asks if this couldn't all be explained by him getting into a role he felt ill-equipped for and making a few mistakes, as he went from joining Site-322 to becoming director in three years. She's pretty sure that's a record, and it's been six years now, and he's had nothing of the sort since. Leg then asks if he failed, as everyone he talked to about this had told him that it was more of a ritual than anything, with them making it seem like a very critical, difficult process, but it's only for show. 052 says that technically, yes, it's difficult to fail these, so Leg says that although he had said that the details of his lateness were not pertinent, he asks them to take a look at a file, and hands out pieces of paper. The file details a sixth example of SCP-001, designated SCP-001-LEG. During preliminary research into this anomaly, Director Paul Legg became extremely ill, with medical examinations finding that Legg had a number of parasites in his system, including hookworm, tapeworm, roundworm, and whipworm. Additionally, the server hosting the draft of the SCP-001 leg proposal was located in Site-7's pocket dimension. Despite being an exceptionally outage-proof server farm, the upload of the leg proposal seemingly caused the first and only large-scale blackout in Site-7's history, culminating in the deletion of a single document, leg's draft. Later, following the creation of another draft, SCP-7525-X manifested at Site-322, an anomaly that corrupts unused SCP file slots. Rather than following its normal pattern, however, it instead solely targeted the research material of SCP-001 Leg. Leg then pivoted to using physical drafting over digital, due to the previous issues. During the second drafting stage, however, SCP-423, an anomaly that manifests in textual narratives as a new character named Fred, inserted itself into the documentation and refused to exit, stating that it really likes this one. During draft attempt 5, Leg hosted all documentation and research material in a hermetically sealed containment chamber. The entrance hall leading into this room contained an airborne anti-meme, preventing those that attempted to enter to forget the room existed, except for Leg. During a Chaos Insurgency raid of the site, however, this room was the sole target of a bombing, and all research materials were lost no other structural damage was sustained. Later, Lag lost the ability to speak or write in any language for a week. Eventually, the draft was finally completed, after Lag was given asylum in the Wanderer's Library. After alerting the O5 Council to the file's completion, Lag was given transport to Site-01, to the presentation the next day, where the following occurred. The jet transporting Leg was struck by lightning eight times and had to make an emergency landing after both engines exploded due to apparent mechanical issues unrelated to the lightning. This landing was near Site 43, where Leg was given refuge until the site's acroamatic abatement system, three containment halls, and a cafeteria collapsed after Leg's entrance to each section. 
Leg instead opted to drive himself to Site-01 in a disguised Foundation van, so as to not put others in danger. A humanoid entity, who Leg claimed was the Birdman entity from the festival, appeared in the middle of a long stretch of road. Attempting to swerve out of the way, Leg crashed into a boulder and totaled the vehicle. The humanoid was not found in the aftermath. At this point it was 2am, and Leg attempted to radio for support via the van's communication system. Upon pushing the call button, the system ejected what appeared to be a mix of blood, seawater, and fryer grease. The van's autonomous driving system then came online without Leg triggering it. The van backed away from the boulder, accelerated, and then made a beeline for a larger, much sharper boulder crashing and subsequently exploding. Legg proceeded to make the rest of the journey on foot, arriving ten minutes late to his proposal presentation to the O5 Council. O51 asks why the hell this wasn't the first thing they saw, and Legg just says that it's dramatic flair, as he wanted to prove it without a doubt. Seven proceeds to call him a bastard. 2 says that it's certainly something, 5 says that this has been their favorite proposal presentation, even if it is their first, and 13 says that they pray to God he strikes him where he sits. 054 says that it's hard to argue all of this, and asks why they weren't told about all of it. Leg says that it's been 6 hours since the car crash, and his cell service wouldn't work during the trip. When he got here, he tried to send an email, but his inbox filled with spam overnight and didn't have enough storage to send anything. He says that that's probably another example. 051 asks him to give his explanation of what happened here, and Legg says that the 001 itself didn't want to be filed and potentially contained. It seems to be a self-preservation tactic at this point and he asks again if they've ever denied a 001 proposal after giving someone the opportunity to research and present one. He then tells them to flip over the paper, on the back of which is one more example of SCP-001's influence. It states that in a historic decision, the Overseer Council votes to deny filing an SCP-001 proposal. Contrary to this, however, the O5 Council does tentatively approve the proposal, and so Legg distributes the proposal to the wider Foundation staff in hopes that his containment procedures would be followed. An hour or two later, Legg meets with one of his researchers, although they haven't gotten any feedback from the rest of the Foundation yet. Legg says that he just got his ass handed to him by the 13 most powerful people in the world. It didn't go how he wanted, but he got the approval by the skin of his teeth. He's rethinking this entire thing now though, as they kept going on and on about how he might have just been rushing into containing these things too fast without understanding them. The researcher counters that he got the approval, so there's clearly some form of confidence in the file and its findings. Leg, however, is not as confident now, and wonders if all the examples he gave would actually constitute a random appearance of anomalous phenomena. He wasted his one chance to be taken seriously, as this place has some of the smartest people working for it, and he really thought that no one would have noticed a pattern here except for him. He should have known better as maybe most people just couldn't fess up to their goofier mistakes, but he literally wrote a file showcasing his own ineptitude and showed it to the most powerful people in the universe. After a pause, he says that they're gonna fire him, but he doesn't care anymore. He doesn't care if he's the last person on the planet to believe in this phenomenon, but he does. Maybe he can chalk up some of it to ineptitude, but there was too much to ignore. He found this anomaly, he did the research, he did the writing, he did that presentation, and he killed it. He feels like he's going nuts, as he tried his hardest. He can look around and see other people who have so much more experience than him, and he failed a lot, probably more than anyone else has. 
But now, at least, he was given a chance to show that it amounted to something. That all of his work and all of his failures added up to something. But really, he's the schmuck who shafted himself again because of his own inability to face the fact that he's not good enough. He's done, even if they don't fire him, as this is the most important moment in his professional life, and he's gonna have to tuck his tail between his legs and go back to grinding monotony as a regular loser. At this point, the researcher says that the data from other researchers relating to SCP-001 has finally come in. One instance, from researcher Alex Thorley, says that SCP-6849 is now contained in the file of 6848, and vice versa. He notes that they switched designations after an internet error, and every computer that tried to open either of the files after that melted into warm goo. Another anomaly, documented by director Randall House, is a Class V ontokinetic entity responsible for the eruption of Mount Vesuvius and the destruction of Pompeii. He tried getting the file out about this thing four times, and every single time someone in the history department flags it and deletes it, along with all of his research material, as they have level 5 admin privileges, despite there not being a history department. Another, documented by director Daniel Ashworth, is a spatial anomaly leading into a desolate pocket dimension. It's only accessible to those who are non-religious, experienced the death of a loved one, and or were witness to occult phenomena. The dimension contained a hitherto unknown cult. Ashworth notes that the cult in this pocket dimension used members of the MTF they sent in there to ascend to a higher plane of existence. They were monitoring what was supposed to be their final ritual when a large man in a white bird costume appeared in a cloud of smoke and bashed everyone's brains in with a big mallet, including the guy they were sacrificing. It also flipped off their camera as well. Another anomaly, from director J. Dune, is an ontokinetic entity resembling a late 40s human male, capable of instantaneous teleportation. It uses this ability to covertly spy on the Foundation and Foundation equivalents, gaining recognizance on the location of uncontained anomalies. It will then teleport to the locations and leave handwritten notes, commonly non sequiturs, unrelated personal messages, and diaries slash journals. Dune notes that they have yet to contain this entity, but this hurdle is within the bounds of its understood abilities. The problem arose when they got close, as it gained the ability to alter digital documentation, adding notes to finalized files regarding containment breaches on the same date and time at Area 179. All of these breaches occurred, and 300 people died. Lastly, from Dr. Jacob Regan, there's a virtual reality chat room created by Foundation scientists that has an inadvertent, intoxicating effect on its users, similar to a marijuana high. Regan says that he thought this was a good idea, and no one will ever let him forget about it, even though it's been defunct for two years. Site-69 tried to take the program down, but it seemed to get a mind of its own and gain consciousness. It got admin access to their servers, and then sold itself to Marshall, Carter, and Dark. It's still around, and anyone who tries to join it while being a member of the Foundation gets kicked. Leg is shocked at the number of them, and the researcher says that there's at least 40 more here, including a rip-off little mister named Senor Senor that was attacked by a gang of actual little misters, and a talking tree that was subject to an earthquake, tornado, lightning strikes, and rot all in the same day. There's also a chicken that lays messages on eggs, that just so happened to lay an egg with a localized black hole that killed it and only it. There's also a list from Dr. Blank over at Site-43 about a bunch of anomalies he lost because they kept destroying themselves while attacking some random guy named Gregory Kaplan. Leg laughs and says that that settles it then. 
Following this swath of anomalies connected to SCP-001, Legg organized a meeting of his most trusted colleagues, containment supervisors, and general Foundation personnel to discuss updated containment procedures. A meeting of over 100 Foundation staff took place, with discussions ranging wildly in perspective. A consensus landed on testing out a hypothesized method of containment proposed by Dr. Blank and Director Legg. Testing was successful, and Legg drafted some updated containment procedures the following week. The containment procedures now state that SCP-001 is contained through the combined efforts of Foundation personnel. Staff who discover SCP-001-affected anomalies will flag their research material, note any suspicious incidents, and send their findings to a collection of the Foundation's containment experts selected by Director Paul Legg. These experts will review all content, point out inconsistencies, and identify potential errors. The next phase of containment will focus on the factors that led to the SCP-001-induced incidents and attempt to pinpoint a vector of containment. When this vector is discovered, containment will once again be attempted. Preliminary tests have found these containment procedures to be 95% effective in combating SCP-001. So there you have it. Despite everything the Foundation is capable of, there seems to be a force that simply prevents some things from being properly contained indefinitely. Or is it rather that there is no anomalous force, and instead human error will always be a presence in any human endeavor? It's hard to say, but I will note, humorously, that throughout all of this, they went from having a containment failure rate of approximately 5.2% to having a 95% success rate in containing SCP-001, the cause of their containment failures. Perhaps it's all simply a matter of perspective. As before, Lag was languishing in his failures, doubting on whether there was an anomalous force responsible. Well now he's optimistically leading the charge in helping fellow Foundation researchers to combat this problem. They often say that perception is reality, and so as long as the Foundation perceives that they can minimize the odds of containment failures, they can keep moving forward.